Time Warner Cable is pleased to be an underwriting sponsor for Carolina Week. Coming up on the October 21st edition of Carolina Week. 100 years of Carolina basketball, a recent national championship, and a new student ticket policy. I'm Jeremy Spearman, and I'll tell you all about that coming up. We'll tell you about a three-decade search for a lost generation and the group helping to find them. In sports, the football team has a huge game tomorrow night, and we'll take a look at the newest club sport. Weathercaster John Boyer will tell us if this week's chilly temperatures will move out in time for fall break. All that, and we have the in about the Carolina Inn. Carolina Week starts right now. From the James F. Goodman Studio in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, connecting campus and community, this is Carolina Week. Many students aren't happy about the university's decision to change the ticketing policy at the basketball games. Good evening, I'm Chris Neal. And I'm Bethany Tuggle. As a result of the new policy, you won't have a guaranteed spot next to your friends at the game. Jeremy Spearman is following the story from the Dean Dome. Jeremy, some people aren't too happy about this. That's right, Bethany, and instead of getting two tickets like students are used to getting in the student lottery, they'll only be getting one, and opinions are all over the place. A new basketball season is on the horizon, and so is a new student ticket policy, one that has students across campus talking. Some are angry, others are happy. Because if I get a phase three ticket and my best friend gets a phase one ticket, then what, what am I going to do? Just go sit by myself in phase three while they're chilling down in phase one? No. There are plenty of other places to socialize with people. I think this should be a place to um, you know, cheer on uh, our team and um, you know, enjoy a sporting event, um, not you know, socialize. Instead of receiving two student tickets to go up these steps through gate D, like lottery winners have for the past two years, winners will now receive one ticket, like lottery winners have for the Duke game in years past. Carolina Athletic Association President John Russell hopes that will bring more students out to the games. It's going to be a better system because it's going to increase student attendance. Students might not be as happy with it because they might not be able to sit with their friends and still have good seats, but it, the purpose of it is to increase student attendance, and we feel like that's what's going to happen. Russell and the rest of the CAA felt pressure to make a change in the system after records showed that too many student tickets were going unused. For one game alone last year, there were nearly 1,500 unused tickets. Some people, I feel, the, the more diehard fans are like this policy and the more casual best fans are probably against this policy. No matter where students stand on the issue, they can all agree about one thing and that's the hope of another title for the Tar Heels. Jeremy, out of curiosity, just how many student tickets are there? Well, Bethany, there are about 6,000 student tickets that go out to students for each game, but those used to only go to 3,000 students. Now 6,000 students are going to get that winning email as compared to only three last year. So more students are winning tickets, but the big problem is people don't have their friends to go with them. So there's pros and cons of this new system. We'll just have to see how it goes. That's Jeremy Spearman in the Dean Dome. Thanks, Jeremy. Winning a national championship in basketball is certainly a lot of fun, but the celebration that follows has campus leaders worried and students fighting to keep things the way they are. This was Franklin Street in April following UNC's most recent national championship victory. University officials are trying to make sure future celebrations look a little bit different. Certainly I would like to see the end of the impromptu fires that are started in the middle of crowds. Uh, on Franklin Street. You either have to say yes or no to the fires. You can't say, I just want to decrease it or I just want it to, you know, go down. Like, that's not going to work. Like, the student body president sparked the debate about the bonfires at the beginning of the semester when she suggested getting rid of them. But many students believe the fires are part of Carolina tradition. It's celebrating the tradition of Carolina basketball and the greatness that we have here. You can't take away tradition. It's like, it's ridiculous. I believe that we can have tradition. I believe that we can do celebrations in ways that don't present that kind of danger. And not every tradition that is in existence is one that needs to continue. Eight people were injured in the national championship celebration right here on Franklin Street. And although many students feel the bonfires are part of tradition, campus officials are making sure safety comes first. The crowds on Franklin Street after these celebrations have gotten so big and so difficult to manage uh, that 
these fires, in our estimation, present a danger. If you're willing to jump over the fires, you specifically have to work to get to the front of the group and jump over the fire, and you know the risks, and it's a freedom that you have. Both sides hope they can reach some kind of agreement so that everyone can enjoy future celebrations and be safe. Students have banded together to keep the fires burning. A Facebook group started a few weeks ago in favor of the bonfires now has more than 1,200 members. Officials have turned down a request to reconsider seeking the death penalty in the Demario James Atwater case. The defense attorney was hoping that a new attorney general appointed by President Barack Obama would agree to dropping the death penalty as a consideration, but the new AG is allowing prosecutors to seek capital punishment. Both Atwater and Lawrence Lovett are charged with the death of former student body president Eve Carson. Lovett won't face the death penalty because he was 17 at the time of the crime. With Election Day coming up, UNC students are getting more involved in political discussions on campus. It was standing room only Monday night in Bingham Hall for the annual debate between UNC's Young Democrats and College Republicans. Three representatives from each group took turns answering questions about topics including global warming, the proposed public health option, and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Both sides were pleased with the large turnout as well as the opportunity for public discourse. Some of those young Democrats and college Republicans probably have already voted at the Moorhead Planetarium on Franklin Street. Early voting started this week and goes through October 31st. Chapel Hill residents can walk in, register, vote, and walk right back out within less than five minutes. The ballot contains candidates for mayor, municipal elections, and school board elections. Online classes are usually attractive because you can do the work whenever it fits your schedule. Ready, ready to teach yourself Spanish? Starting next semester, basic Spanish classes will be available online, and pretty soon other Romance languages might also go online. The reason for this shift is for the school to save money and begin to accommodate for budget cuts. The director of the Foreign Language Resource Center says lots of students are trying to take Spanish 101 and 102, which creates enrollment issues. These doors will soon have fewer students walking through them. Bethany, most people are interested in maintaining basic human rights. Coming up, the story of a group fighting to help young people determine their true identities. It's springtime in the forest of the black-tailed deer. The young male is feeling playful. It's time for tag. The female flicks her ears. Her way of saying, catch me if you can. My name's Lisa, and in nine years I'll be an alcoholic. Hi, Hi Lisa. Lisa. I'll start drinking in eighth grade, and I'll do some things I don't really want to do. So by the time my parents talk to me about it, alcohol won't be my only problem. Kids who drink before age 15 are five times more likely to have alcohol problems when they're adults. So start talking before they start drinking. My parents won't believe it could happen to me. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive too. You know what? I'm alive. We're alive because of biomedical research. Biomedical research saves lives. North Carolina Association for Biomedical Research. UNC places a lot of value on international experiences, so students will have a more well-rounded view of the world. During a recent trip to Argentina, I met members of a group fighting for human rights, a fight few people in the U.S. know anything about. November 28, 1978 was the last day this woman, Buscarita Roa, saw her son and his wife. She spent the next 22 years searching for their daughter, Claudia, Roa's granddaughter. This is Claudia. Since then, it's been nine years now, we've had restitution and a beautiful reestablishment of our relationship. Roa was able to find her granddaughter thanks to the work of Las Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo. 
These women are known for their tireless search for the grandchildren they lost during Argentina's military dictatorship from 1976 to 1983. It was during this time that the government kidnapped, tortured, and murdered 30,000 people for their anti-government activities. 500 of those were pregnant women. Estela de Carlotto, the president of Las Abuelas, has been with the organization since it began in 1977. The death squads kidnapped and later murdered Carlotto's pregnant daughter, Laura. The military gave her baby and many others to couples sympathetic to the regime. Carlotto is still searching for the son Laura had in captivity. El robo de bebés. Robbing babies is a crime, a grave crime of humanity. Time doesn't solve it. For Roa, finding her granddaughter eased the pain caused by the death of her son and his wife. It was a great joy to find my granddaughter, but I also had to wait a long time for my granddaughter to draw closer to me until we could hug and talk. In the early years, the abuelas sought out the grandchildren using relatives' DNA. Today, these grandchildren often realize themselves that the puzzle pieces of their lives just don't quite fit, so they come to Las Abuelas for answers. 2008 was the best year the organization has seen so far, with eight recoveries. And although the abuelas themselves are aging, they expect their work to continue through their children and grandchildren. It's exciting each time the group finds another grandchild, especially for the grandmother. For the grandma, it's a moment of tremendous excitement because she's found what she's been looking for. For so many years, and furthermore, it looked like her son or daughter. Carlotto has yet to experience that personally, but hope keeps her going. Although Roa found her granddaughter, she continues to help others find that missing part of their lives. They helped me find my granddaughter, and it's only right that I help those grandmothers who haven't found their grandchildren. These two women work day after day to help others like them seek restitution for their children who were so cruelly erased from their lives and find the grandchildren some of them have never seen. Next week, we'll meet a city councilman in Buenos Aires who discovered at age 25 that his whole life up to that point had been a lie. Nearly 200 students are waiting to see if their bone marrow can help one local teenager battling leukemia. Doctors diagnosed Cary resident Sarah He with the disease this summer. Members of Alpha Omega Christian Fellowship organized a bone marrow drive inside the student union to help their friend find a match. Participants completed a medical history and gave a DNA sample by swabbing the inside of their cheeks. The information takes up to eight weeks to process. Those who join the registry also join the global movement of more than 11 million people who stand ready to save a life. Gas prices are inching back up again, but a team of UNC researchers might have discovered a way to maximize this precious resource. Scientists have uncovered the first step to converting methane gas into methanol or liquid fuel. They stumbled across the finding while working on a different project. They say this discovery is a critical step in creating liquid fuel. Methanol could offer an alternate source of energy if researchers can find a more workable complex of methane molecules and a practical and economical conversion process. That would lead to more methanol, which will make driving less expensive for all of us. Some are planning trips home or to the state fair for fall break, but two girls plan to walk for a cause. Tiffany Nam and Whitney Akers plan to participate in the Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer three-day walk in Atlanta. For more than a year, the two girls have raised money through events held by their Phi Beta Chi Christian sorority. At a luncheon, the sorority presented Nam and Akers with a gift basket full of goodies to help them walk the 60 miles to downtown Atlanta. Equipped with cooling packs, comfy robes, and comfortable sneakers, these girls are ready for the challenge. Their motivation stems from their house representative's diagnosis with the disease. And as all of you know, in Bethany, today is the first day officially of fall break. Now, the question I have is whether it's actually going to feel like fall. That's right. And we have weathercaster John Boyer here to tell us if we'll have nice fall weather for our fall break. That's right. Uh, thank you, Bethany, Chris. Uh, to be walking around campus today, you wouldn't know there's a big change in the weather for Saturday. I'll have what it means for your plans coming up after the break. Come near. That's the 
the danger dog. Dog. <laughs> Want to feel appreciated? When you spend time with kids, anytime, it helps prevent crime. Passing gas in the presence of others is not only inappropriate... That is so foul. ...it can be deadly. Passing gas releases a fog of carbon monoxide... Grandpa! ...and other poisonous fumes that can contribute to asthma and pneumonia. You're killing us over here. Kids shouldn't be exposed to secondhand smoke. Don't pass gas. Take it outside. Thank you for staying with us here on Carolina Week. I'm John Boyer. Like we said before the break, today was looking nice, but we do have some changes on the way, and that could mean a soggy Saturday. But in the meantime, game weather is looking great. We'll get to it first by looking at the satellite picture. You see that there is nothing at all over North Carolina. Some clouds way off to our west over Missouri and Kansas and way off to our east over the Atlantic Ocean. The surface map shows us where an area of high pressure has just moved offshore, and that's what's in control of our weather. The surface map, if we can go to that, shows us where it's located off the coast of the Carolinas, bringing in our winds from the south, and when there's warm air to the south, that brings that warm air to us. Now there's a system back here over Kansas bringing rain and even snow for Colorado. When we fast forward to Friday, we see that it's gotten a lot closer to us, so we have increasing clouds during the day on Friday. And during the latter part of Friday afternoon and evening, we could be seeing some showers enter into our forecast, and that means rain for Saturday as well. But in the meantime, like I said, tomorrow night, Florida State game, what does that mean for our weather? Starting out tailgating, our afternoon high temperature will be around 77 degrees, uh, partly cloudy skies. Now it will be increasing cloudiness as the game progresses with winds around 8 miles an hour and temperatures only dropping off dropping off really to 63 degrees, so great weather to get out there and enjoy this game. Maybe you have some other plans for fall break. Maybe you're going to finally check out the state fair. A mixed weekend for it because there's some good days. Here's my blue ribbon weather day is Thursday with mostly sunny skies, 78 degrees. It's going to be great. Also not too bad second place coming in for Sunday. Sunny skies but not quite as warm, only in the lower 60s. And then of course Friday and Saturday we have rain shower concerns, so those are going to come in as the third and fourth place days for state fair weather or it's also fall break, maybe you're traveling, maybe you're headed west to the mountains, want to check out some fall color. It is going to be cool and rainy, at least Saturday-wise, in Asheville and along the Blue Ridge Parkway, but the fall color is near its peak. So if you can wait until Sunday, you see where our temperatures and conditions improve much, so you can go out and enjoy some of that color. Or maybe you're headed east out to the coast to Wilmington. Uh, Saturday also not going to be the perfect day with rain showers in the forecast, but Sunday clears us out again. Saturday wise. All right, tonight's forecast. Not as cold as last night, that's the good news. 45 degrees for the Triangle, 44 for the Triad. Warmer out near the coast at Greenville at 48 degrees, mostly clear. Tomorrow, warming up like it did today. A few more clouds than we did see today, but temperatures tomorrow afternoon 78 for the Triangle, 80 for Fayetteville and for Greenville. Winds beginning to pick up out of the southwest at 6 to 10 miles an hour. Don't want to make any of the field goals go, field goals go too far in any one way or the other. But five day forecast on Carolina Week here, 78. 77, a little cooler for Friday, but some rain showers building in for the late part of Friday. And then Saturday, we see we have our best rain chance and temperatures cooler too, 72 degrees. Sunday, 67, Monday, 65, feeling a lot better, but the clouds return on Monday. So there's some great weather if you know where to look. Yeah, it, it seems like great weather overall, so it'll be a good fall break. All right, and I hope you have a good one, Bethany. Thanks Thank so much, John. You too, John. Thank you. A certain weekend activity has some families getting a little lost, but in this case, it's a good thing. This is what it looks like inside Ken's Corny Corn Maze. And as many families discovered Sunday, it all looks the same. This six acre maze outside Raleigh is just one of the fields throughout the Triangle open for the holiday season. Despite a drizzly weekend, many thrill seekers came out to brave the maze, while others enjoyed fun activities like bouncy houses and pumpkin checkers. The fall playground stays open through November, leaving plenty of time for the old and new faces to take on the labyrinth challenge. If you'd like to take a new four-legged companion on your visit to the corn maze, we have just the pet for you. 
She's about 15 inches long, black and white, and a friendly and energetic female boxer, Labrador Retriever mix puppy. If you're wondering what her name is, well, adopt her and give her one. This 11-week-old bundle of fun is looking for a partner to play with, hold hands with, and cuddle up next to. She gets along with anyone who gives her love and attention. She's healthy and ready to go home in someone's loving arms. To adopt her, go to carolinaweek.org for the link. So cute. Now we have Simone Scott here for a look at sports. Simone, the big games tomorrow, but I hear another sport making a little noise here on campus. That's right, guys. You know here at Carolina, we're never at a shortage never, of sports. Never. Coming up after the break, prepare to get hustled and pulled by our very own sports reporter, Emily Hawks. This is Mommy's bed. Me and Jenny were jumping on it. Mommy's gun fell on the floor. I was a cowboy. Bang, 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 bang. I said, Jenny, wake up, wake up. It's just pretend. But she wouldn't wake up. To you, this is a place to hang a coat. To someone else, it's a place to teach a child a lesson you'll never forget. Preventing child abuse and neglect doesn't just mean reporting it, it means stopping it before it starts. Find out how at preventchildabuse.org or 1-800-CHILDREN. A child is helpless. You are not. Don't tell me to calm down. I hate that. Stop acting like an animal. You're in public. I'm, I will knock you into next week. Stop it. No, I'm not going to stop it. That's it. We are leaving I like right now. We are leaving right now. Oh. Get up. Susanna, I said get up. I said get up. Okay. Welcome back. Now, a week of rest is sometimes the perfect cure for a team's problems. Carolina fans sure hope that's the case. After a home win against Georgia Southern, the Tar Heels offensive line looked a little more confident, and confidence is exactly what the Heels needed going into tomorrow's game against Florida State. Luckily, that's one thing the defense has not lacked so far this year, even picking up the slack for a struggling offense. The week off gave Butch Davis a chance to rest some of his banged up players. Now, the offensive line has been especially nicked up. As of today, guard Jonathan Cooper and tight end Zach Pianalto are questionable, while tackle Kyle Jolly is probable. Tomorrow's night's game marks the first time the Heels will play a Thursday night game in Chapel Hill and the first time they've placed off against the Seminoles since 2004. The kickoff is at 8 o'clock. All right, now Carolina basketball, Carolina football, Carolina billiards. There's a new sport on campus, and reporter Emily Hawks takes us to the scene of the cue balls, the cue sticks, and a little bit of skill. Good shot, man. It isn't your run-of-the-mill sport, and it isn't as easy as it looks. But that didn't stop two UNC students from bringing billiards to the Chapel Hill campus. We wanted to create a club that would give people a chance to congregate and people that shared general interest. Junior Josh Walker and senior Tyler Bird started the Billiards Club this semester and it's already popular with students. Pool was something that I've done recreationally for a long time so I figured it'd be a good opportunity to kind of build on some skill and have fun with everybody. The club meets once a week in the bottom floor of the student union. After the university decided to renovate the bowling lanes, university staff members moved pool and ping pong tables in to form a recreation room. The Billiards Club plans to focus on both eight and nine ball pool with standard APA regulations. They hope to eventually expand to play students from other colleges. Walker and Bird are both experienced in billiards. Each has played for more than five years. They're eager to share their love of the game with other UNC students. Well, it's one of those games that everyone from like any kind of personality type they may have, they're probably gonna like billiards. So you get to meet and network and meet, just meet a lot of whole new people. The club welcomes players of all skill levels and already has nearly 30 members. Although some players are involved in league play, the club is purely recreational, at least for this semester. 
In Chapel Hill, I'm Emily Hawks. Carolina Week. Now the Billiards Clubs meets every Wednesday night from 7.30 to 9.30 in the bottom of the Union. Tyler Hansborough accomplished quite a bit in his four years here at UNC. You can add one more award to that name. Hansborough, as well as baseball's Dustin Ackley and women's soccer's Yale Averbush, have been presented the Patterson Medal, the most prestigious award given to a Carolina student athlete. All three players honored accomplished an unbelievable amount in their athletic careers, including 10 All-American seasons between them. The voters also consider sportsmanship and leadership. The Committee of Athletes, Faculty, and Student Representatives make the choices. Now we miss those outstanding athletes, but there's no need to fret. There are plenty of impressive Tar Heels still around. In men's soccer, seniors Clay Donato won the 2009 ITA Carolinas Regional Singles title on Monday. Whew, that was a mouthful. And in field hockey, senior Daniel Ford is reaping the benefits of her team's stellar play as the ACC Player of the Week. Forward scored three goals during the weekend, including the game winner in overtime against Virginia. So guys, I'll be out there tomorrow night wearing my blue and hope to see you guys there. You'll all definitely right. see me there. Thanks so much, Simone. Thanks, Simone. We all know the Carolina Inn has a place within the UNC tradition. That's right, but we don't all know the history behind this first class lodging. Coming up, an inside look from an historian's eyes. If you have a story idea, contact Carolina Week at 843-8292. You can also visit us online at carolinaweek.org. If you have questions about this program, write Carolina Week at Campus Box 3365, UNCCH, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 27599. In after-school programs, your kids will find the hero inside themselves. Let us know you on after-school programs in your area. Call 1-800-USA-LEARN. Today, the world we live in is fast-paced and ever-changing. We need a senator who will lead us into the future. We need courage. We need integrity. We need someone who won't walk away from trouble. We need Bag of Leaves. Cast your vote to elect Bag of Leaves in the midterm elections. If you're not voting, then who are you electing? Hey, how's it going? Sir, are you okay? What? Oh, this is probably nothing. I'm sure it'll go away. Go away? But, sir, that can't be good. No, it's cool, really. Do you want a napkin or something? Everything's fine. Thanks. You wouldn't ignore this. So why ignore the signs of a stroke? At the first warning signs, call 911 immediately. Because time lost is brain lost. The Carolina Inn's a big part of Chapel Hill's history. And without it, I doubt this town would be the same. Elizabeth Lamb takes a look at this historic building. Historian Ken Zagre has walked down the halls of the Carolina Inn for years, and he knows there's more to the building than meets the eye. The public has a tendency to look at this building and think that it's been here forever and that it never changes. But the fact of the matter is that it is an active um, hotel. Built in 1924 by UNC alumnus John Sprint Hill, the inn has seen renovations every decade or so. But designers strive to keep its essence of southern charm, like this checkerboard kitchen floor. Another renovation is in the works. There's every effort to make this a, a, a smart um, building, uh, to, to be as, as advanced technologically as possible. At Chapel Hill Icon, the inn also holds the key to the town's history and has weathered the civil rights movement and near bankruptcy in the 1980s. For now, though, the inn operates with ease. Close ties between the university and the inn draw employees to work every day. There's a very, very strong connection between the University of North Carolina and the Carolina Inn, and there always has been. And it kind of reflects in the people that work here. That feeling seems to be what keeps people checking in to check out what historians call the university's living room. In Chapel Hill, I'm Elizabeth Lamb, Carolina Week. That does it for this edition of Carolina Week. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Enjoy your fall break.